Hello, I'm Joel Seiden, and I have the pleasure of sharing uh, time today with Paul Lowe. Hi, Paul. Hi, Joel. Hi, everybody. And I would like to describe Paul to you, but I have a feeling that you could do a much better job. No, I'd ra rather you do. <laughs> so, <laughs> pa Paul is a very wonderful teacher who I've had the pleasure of spending uh, over 10 years with, and he's uh, clearly one of the leaders of uh, higher consciousness and um, indescribable. Uh, Paul, notwithstanding the fact that you'd prefer not, if I were to ask who is Paul Lowe, what would be the response? Well, the first word was everybody. That was the first word. Everybody is everybody. So who is he as a separation? I don't really know. Uh, if we look at him as a human being, he's somebody that's searched for the, uh, the potential of human consciousness. What's the possible, possi the maximum possibility for a human being? And then all my life, that's what I've looked for. And then as I've received some information, looking to share it. So when, if people were to take that um, description, and apply it to their daily lives. What would that look? How, what would that look like? They have struggles. They have stories. We have we have struggles and stories because we've been programmed by people who have struggles and stories. So your mind has been programmed with these struggles and stories. Uh, religion has says you're a sinner with seven generations of sins, or in the Hindu says you've got a karma to carry, but none of it's very cheerful. But it's, it's all conditioning. It has nothing to do with who we really are. And the people at the source, like Jesus, for instance, he said the kingdom of God is within. That means within you, but you're living a life that somebody else has told you to live. They've said, you can do this, you can't do that. But li life isn't working. The plan is not working. So. Uh the question that comes up for me is if everyone did just what they wanted and there were no society parameters around that, what, how do you feel that would evolve? Well, it wouldn't. Not everybody would do They don't even know what they want. So first of all, you've got to find out who you are. So what do you want? Most people have no idea what they want. They have a vague idea that I want a good relationship or more money. And when they get it, they're no happier. Very rare to find a happy person, to find a joyful, delightful person who's living in the moment and, uh, and really light and playful with this very moment. That's very rare. What if everybody did it? Well, I think we've got a new generation coming in with the new children. And it depends. I don't think we're going to be able to damage them the way we were damaged. I think. Uh, but it's our education system, it's our conditioning, it's our religions, it's everything we've been given does not work. Marriage doesn't work, religion doesn't work, spiritual practice doesn't work, healing doesn't work, doctors don't work, drugs don't work. The world's not working. And so we've got to take a whole look at something, and that means you. You've got to take a look at your life, not waiting for somebody to come along like me or somebody else and say, this is the way to live your life. You've got to find out for yourself what's your way of living your life. And then dare, be different. Dare to be different. Like the great people have always been different. People like um, Einstein and Tesla and, and Reich and all these people, they're all different. They didn't follow this path. This path is a crash course. You follow the path you've been given and you're going to get ill, you're going to be miserable, and you're going to die uncomfortably. And you don't have to. Right. That sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I know that with all of this doesn't work, that doesn't work, it may come uh, across to the audience that there's negativity in that. And of course, I know from my time with Paul that that's not the uh, impression or the intention. Mm -hmm. How would you share that in a way that potent, it's not interpreted as being that you're mm -hmm. against these things? Because I know you're not against these things. Right. And it's nice the way you pick up these things, because I forget how people listen now. It all seems so obvious to me. Just to live your truth. Don't follow blindly. Um, so let's say, I'm not sure it's true, but we'll just say it for the sake of this recording, that 
religion had its time. It was needed at a time. That spiritual practice had its time. It was needed then. It's over. It's finished. It's not worked. We've had Christianity for 2,000 years, and look at the state of the planet. Christians have killed more people than anybody else on the planet. There are 32,000 types of Christianity, and they're all fighting each other. There are sects of Jews that are fighting. They're out in the streets here in New York, two sects of Jews fighting each other physically. And we have the Hindus and the Buddhists, and then the, the, the Hindus have been out 80,000 years, and if you go to India, you'll find it definitely isn't working. So it's not that I'm against these things, or don't go against anything. Just wake up and see it's not working. Marriage doesn't work. It's a fight. It's not love. It's so rare to find two people really in love and really enjoying each other. We've got to wake up to reality. Dare to look how things really are and not how you would like them to be or how the advertisements tell you they're going to be. Wake up. Right. So I know in all phases, whether it's the pharmaceuticals, um, the marriages, everybody seems to be working on unwinding their problems or their issues. So they want to solve the marriage and they'll see therapy or whatever and they'll work on the marriage or they'll work on the uh, uh, issues of uh, alcoholism or whatever mm -hmm. the drugs may, may, mm -hmm. may be. Um, so my question to you is, my sense is that there is a paradigm shift that one can leave that behind and not have to work it out. Could you talk about that a bit? Well, what, what comes when you say that is that our education system is skewed. Our education system is not designed to bring out our creativity. It's not designed for us to be individuals. It's designed for us to follow, do what we're told, and then we're virtually slaves. We're, we're slaves to our religion, we're slaves to our government, we're slaves to the work. And so, so um, we're stuck in this paradigm of, and so we got to start, where do we start? I don't know chicken or the egg, where do you start? You can't start with the parents because they're already programmed. And you can't start with the children because the parents are programming the children. So actually, I don't know what we're going to do until things get so bad, so awful, and we, we're going in that direction, that suddenly we say, I don't know what we're going to do, but we're not going to do it the old way. Like they did in Spain, one quarter of the people of Spain came out into the street once and said to their government, we are not playing Iraq. The next day the government was out. When you, the, the wall came down in Berlin and there was no organization that did that, it was us that did that. We said, enough. When enough of us say we're not going to play the game anymore, then we have to start, look, what are we going to do with these new children? We have extraordinary children. Don't educate them with our educating system. It, it cripples them, it cripples the mind. We've got to bring out the creativity and dare to live in each moment not knowing. Now, I get the feeling you're saying, how do we fix the world? I have no idea. I'd be fixing it if I knew. I don't think anybody knows. But you can start to look at your life individually, which is what you've done, which is what Alan, which is what everybody in this room is doing. We're, we're looking at our life out of the normal paradigm. Yes, not so, I wasn't referring so much to fixing the world, I was referring to fixing each individual's mm. life so that basically they're happier and having more fun. Um, I place a lot of value on having fun and enjoying themselves and then in my view, as they enjoy, they attract mm. more people that mm. enjoy mm. and that ripple effect of, of joy um, mm. has a vibration. But it's back to the education, you see. The education says if your marriage is not working, go to a marriage counselor and check on the marriage counselor. I bet his or her marriage isn't working either. It's very rare to have a marriage working, but we, we, we say, no, we've got to make it work. We've got to make the job work or the this work and that work instead of saying, well, what is my reality? I'm not happy in this situation. I'm going to tell this story again. I love this story. I've just watched a documentary about some Africans who live in the desert 
and uh, they have to go for a long way to, uh, to hunt. And when they go, there's no water. But there are monkeys out there, and the monkeys know where the water is, but they'll never lead anybody to the water. So what the, the, uh, the uh, Africans do, they make a little hole, just a little hole, in a termite mound. And then they get some nuts, and they make sure the monkeys can see. And they put the nuts into the hole. So and then go away, and then the monkey comes along, puts in the hand, holds the nuts, but can't get the hand out because now the hand's too big. The native comes along and captures him. He won't let go of the nuts. He puts a rope around his neck, ties him to the tree, and feeds him salt. And in the morning, the monkey goes straight to the water, and he follows them. We won't let go. Our work doesn't work. Our marriage doesn't work. Life is not working, but we won't let go. We won't say, all right, is there another way? Because we've been programmed. We've got to make something work that's not working. We've got to wake up to the fact it's not working. Mm -hmm. the, uh, yesterday, we had a session similar to this. And one of the women says, my life is so wonderful and good, it'll go away. I'm afraid it'll go away. And you express that we're trained that if things aren't going mm. well, we're looking for the problem. Mm. And, uh, and when you have the problem, you're not necessarily saying, well, this will go away. I have a problem. Mm. Could you just touch on that a little bit? Mm. Um, there's two things there, if I can remember the two things. Uh, uh, if you go to a doctor and you've hurt your knee, he'll give you some exercises to make your knee better, and usually you can get your knee better. But if you go to uh, somebody and have your eyes tested, they don't tell you it's going to get better. They give you stronger and stronger glasses. We just got into the habit of it's not going to get better. Now, but there's another aspect about feeling good, and it, it's a little abstract, but just listen and see if you can feel what I say. When you feel really, really good, you can't really feel yourself. You, your identity gets thin. And then this other part of the brain, panic sense, says you've got to come back. Who are you? Where, the, the worse you feel, the more you feel yourself. Now I know who I am. I can feel this pain or this misery. I know who I am. But when you feel good, you start to dissolve. And then you get afraid. What's happening? Who am I? Everything. And then you're so different from everybody else, because everybody else is complaining and struggling, and you're not anymore. And somebody says, how are you? And if you say, wonderful, people go, wonderful? And then you're outside then. You're not in the, you're not in the complaint club. Yeah. So I know um, in my own life, gra the more I have gratitude, the more I find mm. that I have more to have gratitude for. for. And I'm no longer afraid to express that gratitude or, or live in it. What would be a support system to allow everyone to sort of remove themselves from the complaint, mm. get into more gratitude, and in my view, the more gratitude, the more things will show up to have gratitude for? Mm. Mm. Uh, well, you see, our brain is a mechanism, and it forms circuits in there, loops in there. And that's where our addictions are. We get used to living in a certain way, seeing things, experiencing things in a certain way. So we get locked in there. And then, and there's, there's all sorts of information now, scientific information on the web, th th where you can study this. When you contract, when, when, when you complain, you contract. Literally, you contract your frequency, you lower your frequency, you change your chemicals, you change your circuit, and then in that contraction, that is the way that you uh, interact with the world. So the more you complain, the more you'll get to complain about. And then what Joel is just saying, if you can reverse that 
and, and be grateful. Just sit down and be grateful. Just look through your life and say, oh, yes, I'm glad I know this person. I'm glad this has happened. You literally change your frequency. You change your vibration, but you change your chemicals. Your immune system is boosted. You produce endorphins, which is the same sort of chemical that you, if you take certain uh, euphoric drugs, you, you feel good with gratefulness. So it's not so much making yourself be grateful, because that's a bit artificial. What's more real is catching yourself when you're complaining. Just, oh, I'm complaining. Stop. Don't go there. Just don't go there. And you'll find the gratefulness starts to come on its own. But you've been so programmed in a paradigm that doesn't work, you've got to be very alert to catch when you're complaining. Try one day of observing yourself, how often you complain. It's shocking. Listen to other people. Most of the conversation is a complaint. Catch yourself complaining. Disconnect. It isn't, you're not going against it. You're not doing anything. You just don't continue thinking or talking about your complaint. Come back to the moment. Look at the sky, look at the window, look at the flowers, look at anything but your complaints. You'll start to feel better. And then eventually you'll regrow your brain. And again, that's, that's a scientific fact. You'll regrow your brain that instead of a negative complaining circuit, it starts to open up into something else that is sort of beyond explanation, the peace that passeth all understanding or the Tao or the way or the hidden. In other words, you feel really good. That's the main thing. So how, how important would you say that ingredient that you just spoke about is? I don't think anything else has any value. As I say, the amount of money doesn't make you happy. It's better to have money. If you're going to be miserable, it's better to have, be miserable with money without it. But the money's not going to make any difference. Your relationship won't make any difference. Your children, your work, nothing makes any difference. You've got to get to the vital ingredient. And the vital ingredient is what is contaminating you. And if we look down this particular way, it's your complaint. It, it affects your whole system. Don't complain. It's very valuable. Now, I know we've talked <clears throat> about looking through the prism of the mind. And it seems that the mind, at least my experience, doesn't stop. It's an ongoing system. And how can one disconnect from looking through the prism of the mind? Okay. Most of you are not going to do this. You're too lazy. Uh, you, you want to go and do some classes or read a book or attend church on Sunday and you're going to be all right. Well, you're not. Look, you're not all right. We're destroying the planet. You're not all right. If you want, to, if you want what we're talking about, you've got to change your life and you've got to start to take a look. You've got to start to wake up to when you're not happy and say, what's happening? Uh, but you've got to really want it. If you're lazy or anything else is more important than that, you won't get it. It's, you're listening to this. If you're listening to this, it has to be possible. You wouldn't be listening if it isn't possible. Try it for a day, a week, a month, a lifetime. Try it. Well, as you said, I don't think anyone would be listening and tuned into this show if they weren't interested and uh, curious about what it is that you yeah. have to share. Where I think whatever comes in, into people's uh, sphere of energy, they're open to and they could be awake to. And that could apply to relationships, it could apply to careers, it could apply to consciousness. What can people do to fertilize that, uh, that awareness? How could one enhance the awareness? Um, the first thing is, as soon as you find yourself in an atmosphere that's not fun, that's not nourishing, take a look. You really, really need to be there. And if not, move out. The other side of that, look for an atmosphere that supports you. If you live in New York, there's hardly, ever any, there's hardly any green here. Go to the park or go into a big florist and get amongst that greenery because it'll feed you. The concrete is out of balance. You need feeding. Look for pleasant people. Look for beauty. Look for things you enjoy. Uh, be more conscious about what you eat. 
uh, look for anything that's uplifting. And the next thing is, you need to start listening, you see, because if you start to say, I want to be more happy or I want to be more conscious, you will start to get invitations. But the trouble is, we have not been trained to listen to our intuition. The part of us says, that's where you need to go next, that's who you need to meet next. Go into groups of people that are looking, get into an atmosphere because it creates a frequency. Get, it's like bathing in something that's uplifting and it starts to affect you. It, you, 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 you become absorbent to it and so look for every possible support you can. Uh, if you can, get a group together, a, a weekly meeting and go just to support each other. But the other thing, and, and th nobody likes this very much, you see, you're not going to be joyful until you start telling the truth. You don't tell the truth. What happens is you bend things inside there when you're not telling the truth. There's all stress and strain there. There's no judgment day when you die. The judgment day is here. It's every day you are not living your truth. You're giving yourself a distortion, a pain, a discomfort. So just start anywhere. Start the truth. Just start saying who you really are who you really feel. If somebody says, oh, that's lovely, isn't it? And say, oh, well, I'm glad that you feel it's lovely. It doesn't appeal to me or it's not. Dare, dare, first of all, to realize your truth and then dare to share it. Right. Well, we've, we've certainly discussed how life is a vibration and energy, you know, is a vibration that has an effect. Is there anything that we all can do to enhance our vibration and enhance our joy in addition to what you've shared? Well, most of the things I say do enhance it. So uh, when you are grateful, you're enhancing it. If there's any particular music uh, that you, your heart resonates to, tears come to your eyes or your hair stand up on the back of your neck, it means you're being touched very deeply. Um, so look, and anything you see people put on very damaging music uh, that hits a lower level. Don't be in that energy. Don't be. If you really want to wake up, don't go into that energy. You're literally being damaged because those frequencies. And there's been all sorts of studies. You play that music with a plant and you can kill a plant with music. And also with other sorts of music, it'll grow twice as fast as it normally would. Anything that's uplifting anything you feel good about, anything you look at or hear or feel, um, up, up, lifting, support yourself. So, uh, so leaving the personal for the moment, where do you feel we're going as a collective? It hasn't been decided. That's that, that's what comes up all right. It hasn't been decided yet. Now, again, if you go to th the websites, not the popular press, they don't want you to know this. You go to the websites that are reporting what the scientists are saying. Uh, they're saying the world is on a crash course uh, and there's nothing we can do about it. We've done so much damage to everything. We're running short of water. Um, we're running short of resources. Um, we've got more earthquakes and more this and that. The seas are rising. Um, and so on the logical, practical level, we're on a crash course. And, and at the scientific level, not at the political level, not at the level of the news media, on a scientific level, we're on a crash course. The person that... Um, popularized, or may have even invented the word Gaia for a living planet. See, the, the planet is a miracle. It's kept itself within a certain uh, degree of temperature. All sorts of things happen. The sun has sunspots and we get this happening and that happening. And somehow the temperatures stay there. It's a living or, or And we're destroying that. So on one level, it's all over. It's a matter of time. But there's something else. You see, 
there is something we'd call a miracle. It's not actually a miracle. If we can invoke something else, we can invoke a change that we can't imagine. But it's up to you. If you're listening to this, it means you're awake enough, you're responsible enough to make a difference. What we call the masses, they will never make a difference. Jesus said, we will always have the poor, let the poor take care of the poor. It's people like you, it's your consciousness, it's you waking up. And of course, you can take a look at your recycling and how much you're using and so on. But that isn't the main thing. The main thing is clearing up. So let's talk about that. You see, um, these guys that run the country and keep taking us to war, they're really bad people. But you see, they're a projection of us. Again, this is scientific. The power of the mind. We have biofeedback. We can slow our heart down. This is a scientific fact. You can slow your heart down with the thought of slowing your heart down. You can go under a brain scan and you can turn off your pain by watching an image of how your brain works. Your brain is very powerful. So every time you have a negative thought, you just send out a little bit of negativity. But when you've got six billion pieces of negativity, where does it go? Somebody collects it. That's your war. You are part of this war. Every negative thought you have, you're feeding the war, you're feeding the monster. So uh, what, what can we do that when enough of us, somebody's complaining and you say, I don't need to be rude, but it just feels to me that that's not supportive to the planet. It's a pollution. Don't go there. When enough of us start to do that, and why don't we do it is because we, there's a war inside. There's a part of us we accept and there's a part of us we don't accept. We've got to take a look at this and say, what's going on? Be more conscious, because the source of all war is inside each of us. Until we reach that place of love and caring for ourselves, and then it'll be for each other. Okay. Well, I think we've all heard the expression that what we judge in another is something in us we haven't accepted. Mm -hmm. I think those words need a little bit of more depth, more understanding. Well, again, it's, it's to do with your conditioning. You see, uh, when you become as a little child, a little child at a certain height is just about walking, just about getting around. Apart from the fact they're a nuisance because they keep pulling things off the table, they're a delight, they're full of energy. And they have no thoughts like we have it. They don't think good, bad, right, wrong, can I, can't I. They're just spontaneous. They're naturally in their energy. This is a, what we could take a look at. You see, what happens is this child reaches for something and then along comes this force, this energy, and says, no, bad boy or bad girl. So here's the child who just wants to play bad. And that's when we make the division inside. The, the light, the dancing, the, the beauty, and bad. And then we make this split inside. And then these two parts fight themselves. We've got to recognize what's the heart What's the delight? And where are the rules? And where did they come from? And who told you that? And did it work for them? So it's all about being more aware, knowing, realizing who you are in each moment. As, as the curtain lifts on people recognizing the attitudes and the programming and the that has continued in their life and they start to disconnect from it and uh, live in more gratitude or at least if not gratitude the realization of what is really happening um, then what then what's what's left what happens then um, most people when they see somebody in a wheelchair in the street they don't look at them because there's an empathy and it's uncomfortable that could be me they look at the television and see people starving and they don't let it in. You see, and, I, and I'm not trying to be New Age or... These are our brothers and sisters. There isn't an us and them. There is only us. There's only us. And when we start to get that, we become responsible. 
the people in the street. I'm not saying we should take them off the street because some of them want to be in the street. They don't want to be in an institution. They want to be on the street. But there are some people that don't. We need to start taking care of ourselves, taking care of each other. And I'm not trying to be new age or... These are our brothers and sisters. There isn't an us and them. There is only us. There's only us. And when we start to get that, we become responsible. The people in the street, I'm not saying we should take them off the street because some of them want to be in the street. They don't want to be in an institution. They want to be on the street. But there are some people that don't. We need to start taking care of ourselves, taking care of each other. And that's what will start to happen. As we start to be more responsible, we start to love ourselves, automatically we'll take care of each other and we'll become a global community. Instead of, you look at your history, we have always fought, we've always had wars. But that could be over. And if it isn't over, we're over. We either open up and start to take care of each other or we'll wipe ourselves out. Well, yesterday you were sharing that to be with, that everything is perfect on the outside. And of course, often it doesn't uh. feel like it's perfect. But you were sharing that, every, that to be with what is happening. Yeah. That's a big jump in consciousness. You see, um, most of us know about um, perpetuating the species. Everything's perpetuating the species. We're full of little people in here, little viruses and bacteria, and all they're interested in is eating, they fight, and <clears throat> then they have sex and reproduce. Everything's about reproduction. But there's something else in the human being, and this is what is making a difference. There's an evolution in us. We're looking to expand our consciousness, expand our capabilities and our possibilities. And if we start to become more conscious, we will start to see that, oh, I don't want that situation. But you look at that situation, it's helping you to see just something you need to see. You've been ignoring it. But there it is. And you see, the idea of free will is just an illusion. There's no free will. In the moment, you can say yes or no to it. But if you say no to it, it'll come back to you over and over and over. Because all the time, you are drawing the experience you need. And that's the perfection of it. Be with it. Don't escape it. Don't shut it off. Don't do anything with it. Have the experience, and you will evolve. And the thing about evolving is it feels good. It's like you've been in a snake skin that's too tight. You evolve and you're off to a new level. And the alternative of not being with what is? Is misery, is hell. This, this planet is heaven and hell. And it's how you deal with it. Say no and you're in hell. Say yes, you're having a great time. Now, I know maybe you could tell us a little bit about your blissful life and how you spend it in Australia and what your days look like, because they don't look like most of our days. <clears throat> Ever since I've been really small, I've had the feeling I have to do something about this planet. It's in a big mess, and I'm supposed to do something about it. So to start off, it was hopeless. I didn't know where to start, but I started anyway. And then I realized that I had to start taking a look at myself before I could look at the planet. If I'm not happy, what do I have to share? So I took care of that. I did a lot of meditation. I went to a lot of gurus and went here and there. And slowly and slowly, something evolved. And it evolved into something that I really can't, I can't describe to you. It, it isn't blissful. It isn't wonderful. It just so is. It just is. And I highly recommend it. And um, <clears throat> I came to see that nothing is ever against us. So whenever anything happened, ah, let's say my de partner decided to have sex with somebody else. Actually, that happened quite often. I wonder if that says anything about my sex. Anyway, that they would do, and then there would be this in there. And first of all, it would go towards them or against the person they were going with. And then I saw, no, 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 it's nothing to do with that. It's going on here. 
I need to take a look at this. Then I'd try and fix it or shut it out or I'd go and have sex, uh, anything to escape the feeling. And then one day I said, no, I'm not going to escape the feeling because I don't know what it is. How come it makes me feel so awful? So I stayed with it and I stayed with it and it just started to melt away all on its own until now it doesn't happen. It's now if I'm with anybody and they spend time with somebody else, I'm delighted that they're having fun and I'm delighted the other person is having the fun of being with them. And it's, it's evolved. And now it is about this very moment. Right at this moment, there's nothing except you and I and these people in the room and that siren outside. It's about this very moment. What is the maximum potential of the moment? And Jesus says, take no thought of tomorrow. There's a tradition in, in, in the Judic teaching that says, today for today, let's be here now, because we can't fix the future, we can't fix the past. So let's be here and let's make sure we're not making some mess that we're going to regret later on, which we'll then call tomorrow. It's let's be here now, let's see what's the absolute maximum possibility of this moment. Live just for now, go for it. When in doubt, do it. I think part of living in the present, which you've spoken about since I know you, um, requires an ability to almost live from intuition or almost live from the heart. Yeah. How does one put those two together to live for the moment and then, of course, well, I've got rent, I've got practicalities, I have other things to deal with. So how does one go to live from the heart? Well, there's at least two, maybe three, maybe more people in this room that have done that. And you've done that. And what you've done is you've disconnected from your goal, your contraction. And you've started to say, well, I don't know. Let's see what happens. And magically, I mean, not only your rent is taken care of, my rent's taken care of as well. <laughs> you've, you've let go to such an extent that now everything's come, almost anything you want, anything you wish, now it comes to you. you. Your life is wonderful. And it's because you've let go of safety and security and predictability. You've let go of these desires and this fear of making it work. You've disconnected. And there are several in this room the same. Using the words of Jesus, consider the fields of the the, the lilies of the field, they toil not, neither do they sow. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If you're focusing on safety and security and predictability, it's such a small field, uh, it's so narrow, nothing works. If you dare to say, well, I'll take a month or I'll take three months or I'll take a year to look at living in a different way, try it out. And this, it's not magic, it's science. As soon as you open up these vibrations, you start to bring a different frequency to you that supports where you are. So you keep looking at a rock and you'll hit it because you're, you're, you're focused, everything's on the rock. If you just, it's not positive thinking, it's just saying, I don't know, I don't know. Let's make space for abundance or the unexpected. Let's make space for it. Literally, it starts to happen. You get what you need. It might not always be comfortable to start with, but it'll be what you need. And then life is such a joy. Every moment's a joy. Whatever, whatever, it's a joy. It doesn't matter what's happening. You get stuck at the airport, okay, well, let's have a look around, or let's do the emails, or this or that. It's, it's always perfect. Yes, and, and uh, my life, as I've met you, as I've shared before, I have. Uh, lots of gratitude for Paul and what he shared with me over the years. And some of the perspective is that we're living in an abundant universe. And yeah. of course I've been taught both in economics and every other area that we have scarcity. And so if you have scarcity, mm -hmm. if you're living in scarcity, then you have to, when you get something, hold it, whether it's a relationship, career, money, anything. And if you can shift that to feeling abundant, then you say, well, there's, there's love available and I can stay open for love to show up. There's money available, I can stay open for that to show up. Um, so how can one take 
a lifetime of learning that there's scarcity and uh, to a shift to saying there's abundance in the universe. Well, you know that better than I. You say you're grateful to me, but I'm grateful to you that you listened and you put it into your life because thousands of people have heard me. Thousands. I've been doing it for 40 years. Very few people will dare to let go of something that doesn't work to experiment with a possibility that does work. So you did that. I mean, I was part of it, but you did that. How to do it, you've got to want it. You've got to recognize, you've got to know yourself. You've got to recognize your situation. Is it working? If it's working, of course, there's no motivation. But are you getting ill? Are you getting tired? Are you, are you having arguments and so on? If so, something's not working. Now, we've been taught that life is not a bed of roses. Well, it is, but the roses don't have thorns. It, life is a bed of roses. It's just wonderful, but you've got to find that out for yourself. And if you're living in a particular situation that doesn't work, you've got to look at that. It's not working. So you've got to look at alternatives. Now, you have, but it's not been developed in you, more in women than men, it hasn't been. You have another sense that you don't have online. And you actually have, and this is scientific again, you have more thinking cells down in the lower part of your body than you do in your brain. But in the brain, they're divided. They're polarized, good, bad, right, wrong. But down here, they're not. That's where the intuition comes from. That's where the inspiration comes from. That's where it came from Einstein. When he first got his equation, he didn't understand it himself. It came through. It took him time to understand it. It took the world several years to understand it. It pops in. You've got to start listening. But usually when it pops in, it says something like, listen, this job's killing you. And you say, yeah, but I've got the rent, and I've got this, and I've got that. And you don't listen. So it is killing you. You've got to listen. And, but then you think negatively. We've been taught to think negative. <clears throat> if I give up this job, then no, take a look. There's another way. Maybe you can change the the uh, conditions of your job. But take a look. If your life isn't working, don't keep living it that way. Find another way. Preferably come to one of our workshops and we'll support you. You mentioned the word inspiration. And uh, where people always have enthusiasm and excitement when they're inspired. What, what is inspiration? Where, where does inspiration come from? And what do we have to do to nourish it? Yeah, inspiration it comes from the future. You see, everything's happening all at once. And on one level, you're happy. But if you're contracted, you don't know that. You're living on this level. So when you get a, a bunch of people that are looking, that are honest, that are open, that literally the frequency change, and then you get inspired, you, you get loosened up, you, you vibrate at a different energy. And then you go out and you get back in the traffic or somebody's put a ticket on your car or this, down you go again. You've got to take care of that. You've had thousands of years of this negative conditioning. So you've got to be very aware to have this change. You've got to nourish it. You've got to look after it. As I say, you get one of your parents on the phone and they're moaning and grumbling and blaming, say, excuse me, let it go. Don't don't be brought down. Don't go there. Th same with your own thoughts. If saying, oh, you were silly to do that. You shouldn't have done that. You should have invested or you shouldn't have. Don't listen to that stuff because that will keep taking down. Look for anything that will inspire you. But then you've got to nourish it. You've got to take care of it. And don't get it knocked around. It's like a little shoot. You've put it in. It won't stand the storm yet. You've got to take care of it for a while. So the idea to see the mind and recognize the mind and see that you um, are not, you don't have to be driven by the thought process on, a, on this moment to moment basis. Uh, is there, as we've discussed earlier, any real ability to just recognize that we are not our thinking mind? No, the, the main thing is if, if you are inspired by listening to this say, I don't know whether it's true or it's not true, but I'm going to experiment with it. Take it to the hypothesis, I'm going to try. You see, that part of the mind is like a giant flywheel. 
and it's got an impetus. It's been turning and turning and turning. Or like a railway carriage, you can't just stop it. You, uh, you have to go with it for a while and just start to disconnect, start to recognize. But the main thing is recognizing it, but you won't do it if you don't want it enough. It's like you want to play the piano and you're, you're older, you know, you're in your 20s, 30s or 40s. It's more difficult to get these to loosen up and to get these connections. But if you want it, you'll stay there, you'll do it. Anybody can play the piano. Some people more easily than less, but if you want to, you can do it. But you've got to stay with it. If you want to wake up, not a hobby. It has to be your priority. And don't take it seriously, because it's not serious. On one level, you're already awake, and you'll find that out eventually. You're already awake. This is a game. This is a challenge. This is its supposed to be fun. See, I know mo many people come to Paul during chaos or during crisis, and I think it's so encouraging to, to be looking with, for what Paul has to say without having to go through the trauma or the drama mm. of chaos. Mm. So, I mean, that's largely an encouragement that I would like to share, that your life doesn't have to collapse in order to begin mm. to look. Mm. Now, mm. Why do people wait? Don't wait. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, it's like our health system, you know. Our health system is based to keep the pharmaceuticals going. The, the doctors in, the, there is no, there is no pre state there's no preventative stuff there it's I, I'm gonna smoke and drink and do that and then you got to fix me instead of you got to take a look you got to be responsible for that body it's it's a delicate thing you've got to look after it and so we haven't been taught to look after it in China they did in China at one time you went to your acupuncturist four times a year at the change of seasons because that's when the body gets upset you went to your acupuncturist and you paid him and if you got ill in between, you didn't pay him. It was his job to fix you, because he was supposed to have fixed you here. It was preventative. It was taking care and not indulging and then saying, fix it. Because that's all retrograde. It's, you've got to start looking. And you can start now, not tomorrow. Right now, is there something in your life right now you could take care of? A phone call or something. That, just get that mess out there. When you're talking about chaos, that's right, people come in the chaos. And often what, it's just talking. Now look at this, and look at that, and then see this, and see that. And it's like the spaghetti slowly gets unwound by just seeing it. But you've got to spend some time sitting and taking a look at your life, back to who am I in this moment? And then it'll unravel on its own. Final question, I think. You, you uh, commented the other day that sometimes when you're sitting, um, you, s you feel like up at a very high level of vibration, they're laughing along with us. And uh, I got a kick out of that, and I'd like you to yeah. share that with our audience. Sometimes people say, what is God, or what is this energy, or what is that? And um, on one level, on the serious level, on the esoteric level, it's the unformed. Uh, and I know there's a tradition of God, but that's very childish. There's this vast unformed energy. And we draw the energy out of there with our desires, our unconsciousness mostly, and we produce our life. But there's another way of looking at it, and it is laughter. It's like a ripple of laughter. And it's not that he's not caring for you in your misery. He's not taking your misery seriously. There's this delight. And it's in you right now, if you don't take it too seriously. I want to thank you for taking this Yeah, that was great, Joel. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you, Alan. <laughs>